Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Sean Willsey. And Sean is a distinguished professor of geology at the College of Southern Idaho, where he's taught since 2004. He earned a BS in geology from Weber State University and an MS in geology from Northern Arizona University. I'll just put in a plug, my son's going there this fall. And Sean is the author of Geology Underfoot in Southern Idaho and co-author of the forthcoming second edition of Roadside Geology of Idaho. He's a licensed professional geologist in Idaho and has led geologic field trips for various groups throughout the Intermontane West, as well as Iceland, Hawaii, and Scotland. In addition to geology, Sean also teaches whitewater rafting and rock climbing courses at CSI and is a licensed whitewater and climbing guide. He lives in Twin Falls with his family, who we just saw a picture of um, in our private session before this, a uh, lovely wife and three children. I think I got that right. And Sean is going to talk to us about lava versus water in the Snake River Plain of Southern Idaho. So thank you, Sean. We really look forward to your talk. Great, thank you, uh, Cynthia and Brent. Appreciate the introduction and uh, wanna say hi to everyone out there. A little different format, obviously, but it uh, seems like your group's done a good job of adapting and, and putting this all together. Um, just wanna let you know that I'm here in Twin Falls, Idaho, which is in South Central um, Idaho. Uh, and I guess a good link we have between Twin Falls and Jackson Hole is the Snake River. So we have that, that, that connection, that river conduit that connects these two communities. Um, I'm starting here with looking at the, the cover for my talk, the intro slide here, uh, lava versus water. And this is a topic I've just become more increasingly interested in uh, living in Southern Idaho and doing a little bit of research um, and learning more about the area. And this, this graphic you see here is uh, actually the cover of this, this book I put together, which I'll talk about later. Um, but what this shows, what the, what the publisher wanted for this book was they wanted some sort of depiction of either a past or a future uh, geologic events. And so what we have here is this is the, the iconic Perrine Bridge here in Twin Falls over the Snake River Canyon. This is where the base jumpers jump uh, every day. In fact, today there was a big group of them out there jumping. Um, Sean, the image isn't up yet. Oh, I haven't shared my screen. Sorry. There we go. Is it working now? We good? Yeah. Good. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this image is uh, an artist's rendition of what a, a future volcanic eruption might look like here in South Central Idaho in the Snake River Plain. Um, and as we put this together, it just kind of dawned on me that, you know, this is maybe, you know, one possible future eruption that could take place. Probably the, not the most likely, of course, but, you know, something cool to put on the book cover, I suppose. But it also is, is the story of the Snake River and other streams in Southern Idaho uh, in the past. So this is actually the story that's played out countless times uh, in the past. So we're going to explore this process between lava and water, these two kind of primordial forces. Uh, I'm going to start by kind of explaining some of the evidence we see in the geologic record that lets us know that water and lava have had some sort of interaction. Um, and then we'll, at the last half, we're going to visit a few sites. I think I've picked six or so different sites uh, throughout the Snake River Plain where we can see some of this evidence and these might inspire you to go uh, visit these places uh, on your own. So this is not only, you know, a possible future eruption here, but also what's happened in the past. Um, okay, so hydrovolcanism. Um, that's kind of the big word for, for today. So hydro, water, volcanism, pretty obvious. And so what happens when water and lava interact? And we actually get quite a diversity of features, uh, both constructs, volcanic constructs, uh, different ex uh, explosive behaviors that occur when these two um, these two elements kind of meet and mingle a little bit. And you get a, a, a huge spectrum of eruptive uh, behaviors ranging from highly explosive to very effusive, more passive type of eruptions. And it really comes down mainly to these two big points here. Um, and, and really it's the second one that's probably the bigger of the two, but the depth at which they're interacting, how close to the surface that's taking place. And then really how much do you have of each? How much water is available how much of the magma or lava is available. Um, and those proportions will dictate to some degree what kind of um, 
what kind of volcanic structure or uh, eruption you see. And so we can kind of focus on the left side of this fun little diagram here. Uh, we're going to mainly be looking at mafic magmas, basalt. Uh, that's the common um, rock type and the, the volcanic system that's underneath uh, the Snake River Plain today. In the past, of course, we have had more silica-rich eruptions, but you can see there's, a, there's actually a lot of similarities between them, to, despite the, the differences in the chemistry of the magmas. Um, and so if we have a mafic magma system where there's um, a lot more water than there is lava, and in this case, you know, the, the graphic here is just showing the eruption taking place maybe beneath the ocean or a deep lake or something like that. What we would get then are these things called pillow lavas. And I'll show you some pictures and explain these in a little more detail if you're not familiar with them. Um, as we increase the water content um, at the eruptive site, we can get start getting more explosive conditions and we might start building a taller volcanic edifice called a tuff cone. And so tuff cones, um, actually might look a little bit like a cinder cone to a lot of people, but th there's some subtle differences there. They're not quite as tall and they're a lot wider uh, typically than your, your typical like cinder cone. Again, if you, um, if we increase the, uh, or decrease, excuse me, the amount of water in the system, we might get something where we get a, a tough ring or a mar. Um, these two are somewhat synonymous. It depends on if it's building up above the land surface or it's actually excavating a crater into the, the, the ground. Uh, and then this would be like your classic uh, scoria cone or a cinder cone. So this would be at the end of the spectrum where we don't have much water, <coughs> excuse me, if at all, uh, it's mostly just magma. And so you can see there's, 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 there's a diversity of these things here. And I'm gonna take you on a little tour throughout Southern Idaho to show you uh, some of these different types of features here. <coughs> excuse me, kind of getting over a little cold here. Um, and then the little bonus word there at the bottom is phreatomagmatic. And phreatomagmatic, I need to drink of water, sorry. That just refers to if the magma is mixing with groundwater. So we're going to look at different sources for the water. <coughs> and of course, groundwater can be a potential source as well. So let's look at some of these features then. Um, these are some pillow lavas in Iceland. <coughs> and so this is when basaltic magma erupts underwater. It cools and chills along the margins of the of where the water's in contact with the lava. It forms these kind of rounded or oval, kind of elliptical type of, <coughs> excuse me, features. Um, and you can see sort of a tube that feeds into it. So these are some really nice ones here in Iceland. Um, but we have these in Idaho. <coughs> Here's one that's right underneath the, the Perrine Bridge here in Twin Falls. This one's about 95,000 years old. Uh, and you can sort of see this kind of roundish profile here. This is the actual sort of pillow shape, but you can also see this sort of tube uh, where it's actually feeding into this, this lobe here. <coughs> Excuse me. So whenever I see these, these pillow lavas or any sort of evidence for hydrovulcanism, uh, whether it's in Southern Idaho or any other place, I'm always thinking about, well, where's the water source? Like what, what kind of water body is interacting with this lava? And in some places like Iceland or other places, uh, there's a lot of obvious choices, but when you're in a place like southern Idaho, which is a desert uh, where water is really at a premium, <clears throat> it really kind of is a more intriguing question as to what kind of water body um, the lava may have inter interacted with when it erupted. And I will show you a few sites where it's very clear uh, what the water was interacting with, whether it was, you know, a, a small stream, a large river, maybe like a pond or a, 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 sh a shallow lake or something like that. But other times it's uh, up for interpretation and requires a little bit more work to try to figure this out. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to switch over here to show you uh, a simple, uh, let's see if I can do this, a uh, simple video that uh, shows these lava, these uh, pillow lavas erupting. This is just off the internet here. <clears throat> but you can see uh, the lava just kind of oozing out of these these cracks, but quenching and being cooled quite rapidly. Um, but the interior still pushes forward. Um, this is all off the coast of Hawaii. These are some uh, dive companies videos, but pretty spectacular showing these pillow lavas. But you can start to see now kind of the shapes and the forms <coughs> that we saw on some of the previous uh, photographs kind of coming to life here uh, with some of these videos. Um, so we'll go ahead and that's probably good for now. Um, and 
go back to, sorry, let me get back to the slides. There we go. Um, switch it up. Okay, so these are some of the pillow lavas here in, in, in Twin Falls. Um, so this, remember, this is where we have uh, lava interacting with water, um, but it's underneath, you know, some, you know, we're looking at water that's probably tens of feet deep. Um, the, the hydrostatic pressure, the actual pressure of the, the water on the lava is hindering it from becoming very explosive. And so we're primor primarily just creating these sort of rounded uh, pillow shaped type structures. Well, what happens when it becomes a little bit more explosive? Well, there's a lot of different rock types that uh, result from this, but they're, they're kind of lumped together um, with this term hyaloclastite. And this includes both breccias, so like angular rock fragments like you see here on the left, um, or maybe some, some smaller, finer grain material like a tuff, more like ash type deposits, although this one grades upwards here into some breccias here as well. So now we've actually <clears throat> heated up the water, um, taken away some of the pressure, and the lava is fragmenting. It's breaking into pieces. It's being ex ex uh, erupted explosively uh, near the surface. Um, it's quenching and cooling the lava quite quickly. And so we may get some very glassy type of salts, not, not to be confused with obsidian, which is a different uh, chemistry of lava than basalt, but we might have pieces of basalt that are kind of glassy around the margins a little bit. And then a lot of times these things end up kind of looking kind of yellowish or maybe even orange a little bit. And this is actually uh, an alteration product called pelagonite. So as the, this iron rich uh, magma interacts with oxygen and the water, um, it actually alters some of the material and, and turns it this kind of orangey color here. So sometimes the, the, uh, these hydrovolcanic deposits uh, kind of have this characteristic look to it here. This, this one on the right, these are actually both from Iceland, um, just a place I've been to recently. And so I had some, some nice pictures to show from those locations. So this kind of shows you some of the types of uh, rocks and deposits we might associate with hydrovolcanism. Um, of course, the, the story of the Snake River Plain is, is beyond the, the scope of this lecture in terms of the volcanic processes that have gone on here, uh, the, the tracking of the, um, the Yellowstone hotspot uh, across southern Idaho, which I'm sure most of your most of the audience is familiar with over the past 17 million years. Um, but basaltic volcanism <coughs> has been the main uh, volcanic activity in the Snake River Plain over about the last 5 million years or so. And some of the eruptions are very recent, such as at Craters of the Moon, where our youngest eruption here in Southern Idaho is about 2000 or so years ago. Um, so a lot of these eruptions we see, a lot of the basaltic volcanism in the Snake River Plain um, is subaerial. It occurred <coughs> well, ab well above the water table, not interfering necessarily with any water body, but we do have quite a few uh, pieces of evidence that some of these volcanoes were interacting with uh, water. Either their lava flows were interacting with water or the actual volcanic vent itself was interacting uh, with water. The trick here is that it's hard to see, <coughs> excuse me, it's hard to see the evidence because this basalt covers such the, the, the whole plain is covered in these vast tracts of basalt that we just don't have a lot of the exposures that we'd like to <clears throat> to really uh, tease out the stories of these lava water interactions uh, across the Snake River Plain. But nonetheless, there's enough exposures and enough outcrops that we can, that we can get uh, some data and, and start to piece it together a little bit. And so the main part of my talk here is going to be exploring uh, these six sites here that I have marked with stars. <clears throat> the big blue circle here on, on the right, that's uh, just about Jackson Hole. I think I, I, I needed to fudge it over a little bit, but that's pretty close to where some of you are there in Jackson Hole. I'm over here at this other blue dot here in Twin Falls. And more or less between us across this, you know, <clears throat> maybe 160, 180 mile swath, there's a couple different sites I've picked here. Um, this one is Manan Buttes, which is near uh, Rexburg and Rigby in the Snake River Plain. Some of you may be familiar with that. This is, these two are actually part of the Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve, which is actually uh, not just this lava flow field here. It actually was expanded, I believe, in the early 2000s, and it also encompasses uh, this, these southern lava fields as well. This is the Kings Bowl uh, lava field. This is a, a volcanic feature called Split Butte. 
which we'll look at here in a few minutes. Um, this is a really remarkable little landscape called Black Magic Canyon that's associated with this uh, fairly young lava flow here. Uh, we'll head over to an area called Bliss and look at some uh, interesting interactions between lava and the Snake River there. <clears throat> and then we'll also look at a place right here near Twin Falls, uh, down in the Snake River Canyon, where there's uh, a really fascinating outcrop I've been working on um, lately that shows where the Snake River used to flow at some point in the past. We're still kind of just getting some data on that, so it's all pretty preliminary. Uh, but this is sort of our roadmap for where we're going to be going moving forward. So hopefully you have a rough idea ge geographically and spatially uh, where all these places are. But let's start here. I actually want to kind of go through these um, <clears throat> in a certain order. I want to start with sites where uh, lava interacted with surface water, so rivers and streams. And then later we'll look at places where lava interacted with groundwater because we do see uh, some different features uh, there as we kind of move around a little bit. So all of these are just different variations on the lava water theme that we're exploring here this evening. So we're gonna start <coughs> just a, a few miles from my house actually here uh, in Twin Falls. So this is the Snake River Canyon. Uh, this little area of cataracts and, and uh, there's some chutes in here. It's not, a, it's not a pronounced waterfall, but the name for this place is Pillar Falls. And you can see these big sort of stately house-sized pillars down here along the Snake River. Uh, the rock down here at the bottom is actually eight to 10 million year old rhyolite that's associated with uh, this part of Idaho passing over the Yellowstone hotspot. So these are actually rhyolites that were erupted when Twin Falls was uh, sitting on top of the Yellowstone hotspot. These are also the same rocks, <coughs> resistant rocks that make up Shoshone Falls, which is just maybe two miles or so upstream. So this is a view downstream to the west. But now we're going to wheel around and look at the wall that's basically 180 degrees uh, behind this, this great little view here. So we're going to wheel around. And I kind of set these up um, the way I might approach it with my students a little bit. <clears throat> and that is, I want you to kind of make some observations first. And then I'll kind of show you uh, uh, what there is to see. But this is uh, maybe, oh, this is probably uh, 250 feet, maybe, I don't know, 100 and no, not quite 100 meters, 80 meters or so of cliff right here. There's some of the rhyolite at the bottom, uh, same rock as, as Pillar Falls. And then we have all this basalt. And for the most part, these are all just stacked basalts. Um, but the key thing I want you to look at here uh, is this interesting little area here. There's actually a, a distinct color change from these kind of brownish and red basalts here to these darker, more black ones here. You can see the, um, the edge here kind of drops down um, and we kind of have this little notch then. It kind of it comes down at an angle on this, on this right side, uh, but it comes down more abruptly here on the left. And this, uh, this notch in the basalt, in these older basalts, is maybe about 75 meters across, so you know, about 250 feet or so across. And this is actually a paleo channel. This is where the Snake River was flowing at some time in the past. I can't give you any dates on it right now because we we haven't been able to, uh, we're, the, we're, we're just getting going on this project and we haven't dated uh, any of these basalts here to kind of figure out when, uh, when this might have been flowing. Uh, but I want to take you in a little bit closer because it's, it's a really exceptional outcrop and it has some, some great detail here. So remember the first image I showed you of the book cover showed lava pouring into the canyon. If you think about it, Lava and water have been just fighting over the same real estate in southern Idaho for five million years. Um, every time uh, a volcano erupts and sends and lava comes out of the vent, that lava ends up going downhill, and the lowest point in any landscape in the so those lavas will tend to go down, uh, pour down off the canyon walls pour into the channel of that stream or river. <clears throat> and if there's enough lava coming into the system, you can actually completely inundate and plug up the canyon system. And so whenever this happens, the, the river is forced to <clears throat> find a new path <clears throat> and carve a new canyon <clears throat> elsewhere. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the story that's gone on for, for at least several million years for the, the, the Snake River. I, I call it the poor Snake River because it just gets bullied. Every time there's a volcanic eruption, and there's been so many, the lavas end up 
uh, you know, more times than not in the Snake River's channel and it gets forced into some new location. So the place we see the Snake River flowing today through Southern Idaho is really kind of its um, most recent location. Um, it's probably been at a lot of different places throughout the Snake River Plain and we're just seeing its most recent um, diversion and the most recent canyon that it's got. So I'm gonna take you a little bit closer into this view. Um, this is kind of what it looks like here. This is maybe, I, I guess I don't have any scale on this one, but you're looking at maybe vertically uh, about 10 meters or so of cliff face. But you can see these, these kind of tan older basalts down here. Then there's this interesting layer here. And when you get in here and look at these, these are filled with gravels, like fist size to maybe cantaloupe sized gravels, um, all very rounded. Um, and then there's a nice distinct contact. And then we can see some of these nice pillow basalts, these pillow lavas that have poured over on top of these here. And as we go upwards, we can see that those classic pillow shapes more or less end somewhere about here. Um, and if you get a wider view of the whole cliff face, you can definitely convince yourself of that. Um, <clears throat> these river gravels are mainly quartzites. Um, there's some basalts, but it's mainly rocks that have that are not sourced from anywhere locally uh, in South Central Idaho. These are rocks from over where, where you, where many of you folks are, are living, over near Jackson Hole, the Tetons, some of the mountains along the Wyoming uh, Idaho border. And so to me, this is a really compelling evidence that this is the ancient channel of the Snake River. <clears throat> the gravels are big. They're coming from sources that would be uh, to the east. Um, and this whole is large enough that, that it makes sense that it would have to be some ancestral uh, Snake River Canyon. Um, so I'm going to take you now, the next slide is going to take you uh, to the left of this slide, so kind of to the north end uh, of this larger, um, <clears throat> this large exposure here. Um, and we can actually see again the older basalts here in the brown, the gravel beds here, and then the pillow basalts coming in here. And what's interesting here is you can actually make out this perfect contact between uh, the older basalts and the lavas that filled the ca canyon, that filled the Snake River channel kind of flowing down into here. And so what we can actually deduce then by kind of tracing this out is the actual channel morphology or the shape of the stream bed um, where these gravels were laid down and where this lava poured in. This lighter stuff here, this is a little sand layer or a little lens of sand sitting on top of it. <clears throat> um, I didn't take it all the way to the end, but if you, if you trace this out further to the right, it actually sort of pinches out a little bit uh, and if you know anything about rivers and sort of the shape of riverbeds, uh, this, this is suggestive of a, this would be the outside bend of a meander where you'd have this deeper uh, and steeper cut uh, into, the, the, into the bedrock here. <clears throat> and then back over here to the right would be where you have like the inside of the bend or what we, where we sometimes find point bars, that sort of thing. Uh, again, nothing conclusive, but it's highly suggestive of that. The other thing I find interesting about this is if you can trace out where those pillow lavas more or less end as you grade upwards. Uh, and this all appears to be the same lava flow. Um, you don't get into a separate flow until you're a little bit further up this cliff face. Um, so where the pillows end, that would seem to indicate the top of the river. So you can imagine the lava pouring into the bed of the Snake River, <clears throat> forming pillows because we've got too much water uh, pressure on top of it. And we've got the, the lava moving over the, uh, over the top of it as well, adding some pressure. Um, but the pillows would only be forming uh, below the, the river surface or the water surface there. So you can actually then estimate to some degree how deep the Snake River was at this location uh, from its bed uh, up to its surface. And I, did, I haven't measured this yet, but it's, it's maybe you know, four meters, maybe 12 feet, something like that. Um, so this, this is uh, kind of my, my, my newest um, uh, project I'm, I'm kind of starting to work on and, and, and getting more excited about. Um, but let's go look at <clears throat> some other places here. Let's go look at a place. Well, what happens if uh, a large amount of lava goes into the Snake River? This is obviously some amount of lava. And obviously, the river's diverted because it's not flowing through here anymore. But what else can happen when uh, large amounts of basaltic lava pour into uh, a big river system like the Snake River? So now I'm going to take you about 30 or 40 miles west of Twin Falls. Um, and you can kind of see on this Google Earth image, you can see the, the, the freeway system, I-84, <clears throat> kind of going through here. Uh, you can see the path of the Snake River through Hagerman, 
um, <clears throat> and then off to the west. There's two other rivers here, <clears throat> excuse me, shown on, on the right. This is the Big Wood River. This is the river that goes through Ketchum and Sun Valley and the Little Wood River. Uh, and these join together just west of the town of Gooding uh, and forms a river called the Malad River. And some of you may have been to Malad Gorge, which is a state park here uh, right next to the freeway. What this is showing here in red is this is an eruption that happened about 50,000 years ago from a volcanic vent, a shield volcano called McKinney Butte. And so lava from McKinney Butte uh, actually went into the Snake River uh, and diverted it. In fact, you can see the, easy, the, the relationship here between the lava flow, where the lava flow's extent uh, is, and where the path of the, not just the Snake River, but some of these other river systems as well, you can see that the, the eruption has dictated the path of the river uh, to a large degree. And so when this McKinney Butte eruption took place 52,000 years ago, uh, the Snake River was maybe not uh, in exactly the same position, but more or less in the Snake River, or more or less, excuse me, in, in the same position it is today. And so lavas from this eruption went into the Snake River and they formed a lava dam. And we can actually see evidence for this lava dam uh, in the forms of pillow lavas that run up and down the Snake River for maybe like five or six miles. <clears throat> and so the, the cartoon here kind of shows uh, the sequence of events that would have taken place. Lava pouring downhill from the McKinney Butte eruptive site towards the Snake River, lava <clears throat> cascading over the cliffs, going into the Snake River, which would have produced a lot of steam, a lot of that lava would have just gone right to the bottom of the bed there uh, to form pillow lavas along the bottom of the of the river channel there. Uh, but then what's interesting here is we have evidence at this location that this lava formed a dam across the Snake River for some period of time. We're not sure exactly how long, but it seems to have persisted for maybe several years, maybe a few decades. Um, and in doing so, this lava dam backed up the Snake River and formed uh, a lake, uh, and we call it Lake McKinney after the, the butte that formed the, 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 the eruption there. And behind this lake, or behind this dam, excuse me, as the, the river water was slowing down and it was impounded to form this large lake, uh, the fine grain material actually settled out onto the bottom and formed some pretty uh, impressive and expansive deposits of clay. This is actually a formal geologic unit called the Yahoo clay. Uh, it has nothing to do with the internet, has uh, everything to do with a little stream nearby called Yahoo Creek. As you can see the rock hammer here and you can see these, these bedded clay deposits um, in a little road cut here. Um, I'm not a, a pottery person, but uh, there's actually people who are, are into pottery that'll go uh, excavate some of this stuff and they tell me it's, it's an exceptional uh, clay to use on a wheel and make pottery out of. Um, so what was the, what was the eventual um, outcome of this lake? Well, <clears throat> the lake maybe maintained itself for some period of time. And so there's some thoughts that maybe the dam was somewhat leaky. Uh, if you think about these pillow lavas, they actually have uh, fractures around them and pore spaces. It's not hard to get water to travel through this stuff. So <clears throat> perhaps this thing was just leaky enough that water went through it and kind of more or less kept this lake uh, constant in terms of its elevation for some period of time. Again, we're not we're not really sure. That those are things that they're trying to uh, be worked on. Uh, but the 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 inevitable outcome of, of this lava dam was that it was eventually breached. Uh, you know, later, 17,000 years ago, you have the Bonneville flood coming through here, and the Bonneville flood probably took away a lot of the good evidence of of this geologic event. And all we have now is just a few scattered outcrops of both the clay. Uh, and the pillow lavas that sort of cling to the canyon walls uh, in, in a few different places. Um, so a little bit different story here where we have the, the eruption uh, being on a large enough scale that it actually dams up the river for a period of time, uh, deposits these clay, these clay layers uh, behind, behind the dam in the reservoir, uh, and then eventually gets breached by the river uh, and is, is through going now. One last twist to this story at this location here in Bliss is that all this clay was deposited along the canyon walls. Um, and then in 1993, uh, you can see the Snake River here in the foreground. This is a, a looking to the north. Um, <clears throat> the town of Bliss is up here where the trees are and the freeways up there as well. 
1993, in July, there was a, a landslide and a huge section of this clay that had just been kind of, again, plastered onto the landscape here, <clears throat> got saturated enough that it mobilized, slid down into the Snake River, moved the Snake River. The Snake River used to flow right about here. You can actually see one of the old cut banks over here, uh, another embankment over here. <clears throat> moved the Snake River about 100 to 200 feet, depending on where you're measuring. Uh, also constricted the Snake River down to a much narrower corridor. And now this is a picture at low water, so it's maybe not as impressive, but at high water, this has formed a, a large uh, set of waves um, and the largest rapid on this section of the Snake River. This is called Slide Rapid here. You can see the, the V-shape of the tongue here. Um, so kind of a, a cool little story where we have this ancient 52,000 year old lava dam <clears throat> that forms a lake that deposits clay um, and then that clay actually gets reactivated later on. Oops, my light just went out in my office. There we go. Um, that gets reactivated later on uh, to form this, this landslide that actually extends out into the river itself. Um, so really kind of a remarkable little landscape here uh, down at Bliss. Um, let's look at uh, another place where a river has been diverted and kind of what's gone on there. Now we're going up uh, north of Shoshone, so north of Twin Falls. <clears throat> there's a shield volcano called Black Butte Crater. And this is the youngest volcanic feature in the central part of the Snake River Plain. It's about 10 to 11,000 years old, <clears throat> right along Highway 75, the highway that goes from Twin Falls up to Sun Valley and Ketchum. Uh, so some of you may have driven past this thing. It's also where the Shoshone Ice Cave exists. Um, so this eruption actually also played a role in diverting a, a river completely. This is uh, a possible rendition of the Big and Littlewood Rivers where they might have merged before this eruption took place. And this is the current state of affairs. So you can actually see that these two rivers likely uh, converged um, maybe at about this point here. Um, but because of the eruption, the eruption actually separated these two uh, river systems. And now they don't meet until you're well uh, west of the town of Gooding here. Uh, where they formed the, the Malad River. So this is the Shoshone lava flow. But what's interesting about this site, so we have an eruption of lava that has diverted this river. So this lava went right into, you can see where it's, where it's at in relation to the Bigwood River. Lavas from Black Butte went right into the Bigwood River, which probably didn't have a very big channel or canyon, but it filled it up completely. There's no exposures of this today. It's all buried. So it's, it's anyone's guess as to where where exactly it is. So this is somewhat a, a hypothetical, but just a best guess. Um, but in doing so, the eruption of Black Butte diverted the Big Wood River to a new location, and it started cutting through a new, or excuse me, uh, some older basalts. And it's this really uh, cool little canyon landscape called Black Magic Canyon, which maybe some of you, again, heard of as well. Uh, it's basically a slot canyon cut into basalt. It's an incredible little place to take a little hike, you see all sorts of shapes uh, and flutes as, as the gravels from the Big Wood River would come down through this thing, especially during the last ice age. Um, those hard gravels that were you know, shed off the Pioneer Mountains uh, near Ketchum and some of the other mountains to the north um, <clears throat> act as an abrasive and cut into the basalts, which are already pretty hard themselves, uh, and have excavated a canyon that's maybe 30 to 50 feet deep in places quite narrow in many spots, maybe like, you know, 10 feet across, something like that. You see all sorts of uh, cool potholes. There's, there's my daughter and her friend a number of years ago in one of these large uh, circular potholes. There's a smaller one there. And these potholes eventually can sort of merge together <coughs> to get these sort of fins and windows and some of these other cool uh, kind of ethereal shapes you see here. This is a graphic showing how these potholes would form when you have floods and currents of water and little uh, vortices or whirlpools in the water <coughs> that drags some of the gravels around in a circular direction. So it's really working just like a drill bit. And as those uh, gravels get kind of moved in a circular direction, eventually they uh, cut deeper and deeper into the rock and then they get trapped in the, the very hole that they created. So every time there's enough water to swirl around in these things, they just bore deeper and deeper uh, into the underlying basalt until you get some of these incredible uh, these incredible um, potholes here that you see uh, along uh, the Black Magic Canyon. Uh, pretty incredible uh, little landscape. Um, so this is Black Magic Canyon. Uh, and so we've been looking at a few places where 
lava and surface water have interacted. Uh, in our last three sites, we're going to focus on a couple of places where uh, lava has interacted with groundwater. And the first place I'm going to take you to is the southern end of Craters of the Moon National Monument. This is called King's Bowl. Uh, it looks pretty impressive right here, but if you zoom way out, it's one of the smaller <coughs> lava fields in southern Idaho. The, some of the bigger ones at Craters or the Wapai Field or Hell's Half Acre are much more expansive. This one's actually, uh, I don't know how many square miles it is, maybe a few. It's, it's not that big, but you can see that this type of an eruption uh, was a fissure eruption. So you can see this big crack running across the landscape here, running more or less north-south. Um, and the lava just sort of oozed out of this crack in the ground uh, and spread across uh, the landscape. Very similar to the recent eruption we had and that's ongoing in Iceland or some of the eruptions we've seen uh, recently in Hawaii, this sort of fissure eruption. But one interesting thing about Kings Bowl is it has this this central feature that's much wider. Most of the fissure is pretty narrow, but you get to this one spot here, and this is why it's called King's Bowl, <clears throat> and the fissure is maybe uh, six or seven times as wide as it is elsewhere. And the geologic story here is pretty fascinating. What, what we've been able to piece together here is that at some point during this eruption, um, a little bit of groundwater started mixing in, and maybe this was a preferential site because there was higher permeability in the rocks, or for whatever reason, the water, groundwater <clears throat> was able to mix with uh, the magma in the subsurface. And when it did that in this location, it became explosive and it started throwing blocks of rock from the walls of, of this fissure out onto uh, the landscape. Well, at the same time as these blocks of rock are being thrown out onto the landscape, uh, over here on the west side is a lava lake. So this lava has oozed out forming this big lake of lava, but it started to crust over a little bit, just barely. So the, the, maybe like the, the upper inch or two of this lava lake has cooled and crystallized, but beneath that, it's still molten. Well, while these blocks are being thrown out onto this landscape, some of them just end up embedded in the lava. So you can see this, this discolored piece of basalt here. This is um, a chunk that was thrown out of King's Bowl that kind of cracked and broke through the crust of the lava lake, but that was all it did. It just kind of made a little impact crater for itself and it just sat there. But in other places, these ballistic projectiles of wall rock coming out of the fissure actually punctured the lava lake um, when there was still molten lava beneath it and they oozed out of the ground to form these squeeze ups. So these sort of candy kiss, cow pie, uh, you know, these toadstool mushroom little shaped things here um, are actually places where the lava oozed back upwards through the, through the fracture or the hole caused by um, these rocks being thrown out. And as you walk from the fissure out to the west, it's really quite remarkable because they're, they're really abundant. Um, and then you can actually kind of see them kind of fading out and becoming smaller and less numerous uh, as you work your way to the west. But um, kind of a cool little feature and one I've really not seen any other place where you have this lava lake that was impacted by an, an explosive event uh, that then formed these, these cool little squeeze ups in different places. There's, there's two in that view there. Um, so another really uh, interesting place that, that I recommend uh, folks check out if they have, uh, have the time and the means, uh, pretty easy to get to. Um, this is the Wapai uh, Pillar Butte, uh, Wapai Lava Field. Pillar Butte's the eruptive site in the background. This is a big shield volcano. And again, that's, that's looking to the south there. So this is a case where Magma interacted with, with just a little bit of groundwater, just enough to make it explosive locally. Let's go look now at two more sites where the interaction with water was, was greater. Um, and this is the place closest to Jackson Hole. This is uh, just west of, <coughs> or southwest, I guess, of Rexburg, Idaho. Um, and this is called Manan Buttes. And you can see there's a north one and there's a south one here. Um, interesting location of these these vents because this is where the South Fork of the Snake River, which runs through Swan Valley, joins the Henry's Fork <coughs> of the Snake River. And at this point is where it becomes, you know, the true Snake River from this point uh, all the way to the Columbia. Uh, and these two cones here are really interesting because you can see they're a little bit asymmetric. They, they, there's the crater there, but they're bigger or broader uh, to the northeast. And what that suggests is that the wind was blowing from the southwest when these erupted, 
and the 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 the, the the tough, the ash and, and other materials being blown out of it, um, it piled up more favorably on the downwind side, which in this case was to the northeast. But think about this graphic a little bit as, as we talk about it, because um, just because the Snake River today or these two forks of the Snake River meet here, uh, there's a good there's good reasons to believe that that's that's a product of this eruption, right? That this eruption changed the path of these river systems in this area. It's very likely that these two forks of the Snake River met maybe somewhere over here. Um, and so this volcanic eruption right at the confluence of these two rivers um, had some pretty cool, uh, pr pretty dramatic results here. So here's the trail. There's actually a trail going up North Menan Butte. So you can see some people here in the foreground, very broad and wide. Uh, so again, these are tough cones. These are uh, kind of steep sided. This thing's, you know, maybe about 500 feet tall, 160 meters, somewhere like that. Um, so steep sided, uh, but not as steep and uh, narrow as like a, a cinder cone. So very broad. Here's some, a picture of some of the bedded deposits. So the, the ash and the, pirate, uh, the material that was erupted, the tephra, uh, the stuff that was thrown out of the vent during the eruption piled up along the flanks of, uh, of the, the cone here. So this is what you see along the outside of it. But what's most interesting about this is, is in a couple places, when you're looking at the, this tuff, this, this ash material here that was caused by this explosive interaction between water and the magma, what you see occasionally here are these nice rounded uh, river gravels, uh, pieces of quartzite, that sort of thing. And so these are all pretty good evidence that <clears throat> this eruption was tapping either, was tapping gravels, you know, shallow uh, gravels uh, in probably the South Fork or, or maybe the Snake River itself when it erupted and probably with some groundwater in, influence there as well. So this is probably a combination of shallow surface water in the river <clears throat> and groundwater. The water table would be pretty much at the surface there right by the river. Uh, but you see some of these pieces of river rock uh, embedded in the, these, uh, these pieces of hyaloclastite, these uh, hydrovolcanic uh, deposits. Uh, so pretty, pretty remarkable little um, uh, feature here over in, in eastern Idaho. And again, the trail up to the top is spectacular. You can walk around the rim, uh, a really cool place to, to visit. Um, the last one we're going to look at here is Split Butte. So Split Butte is pretty close to Kings Bowl. It's also in Craters of the Moon National Monument down at the south end. <clears throat> Takes a little effort to get there, um, driving some, some gnarly roads. But this is it. You can see it on Google Earth nicely. So I encourage you to visit these places. If not in person, you can get on Google Earth and, and check them out there as well. Uh, but this is a big, huge circular crater. You can actually make out my truck <clears throat> right there, right underneath the... the the 500 label there um, to get, kind of give you a sense of how big this thing is. This is um, quite large. Um, and around the rim, you can see over here along this rim, and then in the foreground here are the bedded uh, deposits of tuff, of, of the ash, of the stuff that was blown out of the ground. And so this is a tuff ring, and tuff rings um, are created with more water interactions. So this had a lot more water that, it, that was available during the eruption. And so it excavated a much larger crater. This is a much larger crater than we see at Menan Buttes. It's not as tall. It's, it didn't build up as, as large of a, a construct in terms of height, um, but it's much broader. Um, and so we've got explosive interactions taking place here. And again, if you know anything about this part of Idaho, the, the wind often blows. And so this is actually looking to the west. And so you can see that the most of the tuff is de was deposited on the east side, indicating the winds were coming out of the west. And that's a, a common theme uh, here in southern Idaho. So he, again, here's the bedded tufts that you can see here. Again, that kind of yellowish, kind of orangey colored. That's the pelagonite. That's the discoloration product as the basalt uh, gets uh, oxidized. It's a, sort of an, an oxidation process. Um, and then you can actually see embedded in, in these tufts in places are older basalts that were thrown out. So this chunk of basalt was probably in the subsurface at some level and was ejected with the pyroclastic ash that was uh, thrown out during the eruptive phase uh, and sort of embedded and plastered in there as well. Uh, so another really spectacular uh, site here. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully this has been a nice 
uh, educational experience to learn a little bit about what happens when lava and water interact. So not only some places that maybe you can check out and visit, but also learning about the various types of um, hydrovolcanic features uh, that exist here in, in southern Idaho. And if you're interested, um, this is the book I put together a few years ago uh, that has some of these sites, but also some other sites. This is actually the different sites that are in this Geology Underfoot book. Uh, this is available now. Um, and then this, is, this should be coming out literally next week, uh, the new Roadside Geology of Idaho um, edition that myself and Paul Link and Keegan Schmidt spent the last three years working on. Uh, I included a little map here of uh, one of the geologic maps for one of the highways over towards Jackson Hole. So this is the from Swan Valley over to Victor, Highway 31, just so you can kind of see what some of the maps look like. Um, and they point out different geologic features along the road. And then the written guide obviously uh, tells you, you know, things like at milepost 222, this is what you're looking at, that sort of thing. But if this was helpful and you liked it, I also have some uh, short little geology videos on YouTube. So if you just Google my name on YouTube, um, you can see some of the videos I put together uh, for my students, but also for anyone that's interested. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I'll turn it back over to Mike and see what questions you guys have. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. This was excellent. It, uh, it reminds me of how awesome our field trip was to King's Bowl. It is truly a spectacular spot. And, uh, and everything that Sean described there, you can walk around and see as you walk on a, a, an old lava lake that has been uh, impacted by all this ejecta. So it, it, it uh, yeah, it was excellent. And could you remind us again of what was the date on the uh, Kings Bowl eruption? Yeah, thank you. I forgot to mention that. It's about 2,200 years old. So it, along with the Wapai field, which is right next to it, and the youngest eruption at Craters, <coughs> excuse me, are all right there at about the same, right around 2,000 years old. So it's one of the, it, it's essentially one of the youngest uh, eruptive sites in the Snake River Plain. Okay. Uh, so a number of questions. So how thoroughly and how often was the Snake River dammed by these lava flows? Yeah, <laughs> it's, I have no way of answering that directly. Um, this, the, this, the outcrop I showed you at the beginning at Pillar Falls was exciting to me because it was, it was, to me it's unequivocally, it's the Snake River, right? I can see the gravels there, it's, it's the right size and it's right next to the Snake River so you don't have to do too much conjecturing. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of these lava dams uh, in the Snake River proper, uh, there's a few, I think there's a couple others over towards Boise in the Swan Valley area. Um, I'm going to say there's just a couple that have been documented uh, that, that we know of, but probably there was so many more that we just don't have evidence of because these eruptions just, you know, end up stacking one on top of another. And so a lot of that evidence is buried underneath younger lavas. Um, there's a good chance that the Snake River, if you really look at the Snake River plain and where the Snake River is, like at Idaho Falls near Pocatello and at Twin Falls, it doesn't make a lot of sense. In a, in a valley that big, you think that the river would be sort of near the middle, but it's way to the south. It's been pushed to the south end of the Snake River Plain by these volcanic eruptions, by these lava flows that have inundated it and nudged it, you know, maybe a quarter mile, a couple hundred feet, whatever. Um, and so it's right now, it's really impossible to tell to kind of be succinct with that answer. Uh, can you talk about the, how glassy basalt is different than obsidian, which I always considered a very amorphous crystal structure, very glassy as well? Yeah, so they, they can look somewhat similar, um, but, the, 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 but there's different chemistries and different properties. So uh, obsidian is silica rich lava that cools quickly. So that'd be more like a rhyolitic uh, material or rhyolite magma. Um, you can take basaltic lava, and you, you've seen videos or pictures of this all the time. Maybe some of you have actually done this, where you know the geologist sticks their rock hammer in the basaltic lava in Hawaii, puts it in the coffee can, and they pour the water on it to quench it. Um, so that's cooling about as fast as you can, and yet that material is not true obsidian. It doesn't have, like you said, it's not the amorphous material. It's a different chemistry, 
it doesn't break the same way. So you're not going to turn glassy basalt into, um, you know, an arrowhead or a spear point or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so any type of lava can cool quickly, but only the silica rich lavas will form that true obsidian type material. Glassy basalt is just basalt that's a little bit shiny uh, along the margins. It still has, in many cases, vesicles or little gas bubbles in it, but it doesn't have the same glassy. It's glassy in terms of it, the way it looks, but it's not glassy like compositionally like obsidian is, if that makes sense. No, it, it does make sense. And when I think about the, uh, the, lar the, the most recent large flow uh, in, in Southern Yellowstone, the pitchstone, that, that looks very, now I, now I get it. That, yeah. That, that's a glassy looking obsidian, a glassy looking basalt, sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's just a big difference there chemically uh, between basalt and rhyolite. They're at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and obsidian, it doesn't even have to be, the only way to get basalt glassy, the best way to get basalt in terms of its t glassy texture is to have it interacting with water. So it's quenching and cooling quite quickly. Uh, obsidian oftentimes, well, obsidian is going to be glassy, but it doesn't necessarily require, you know, the water component to, to have that same texture. Right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> is there evidence of rhyolitic magmas interacting with the Snake River? Uh, because there are rhyolite domes on the Snake River Plain. Right. So, so if you go back to thinking about the Snake River, the Yellowstone hotspot and Southern Idaho passing over it. Um, so as, as the Southern Idaho is passing over that hotspot, that's actually raising the ground up. And so wherever the hotspot is, the ground above it is typically high topographically and water is draining off of it radially, just like we have with Yellowstone today. Yellowstone's on the continental divide. So those older calderas, you know, the classic calderas going back down along the Snake River Plain, there's no evidence that those were interacting with the Snake River because the Snake River as we know it wasn't around, right? So 10 million years ago, the Yellowstone hotspots in Twin Falls and rivers are draining west from Twin Falls like they do today, but they're also draining to the east and to the south and to the north because Yellowstone was actually the topographic high point at that time. Uh, if that makes sense. It's probably a topic for another lecture. Now, over uh, near Boise, they have some younger rhyolites there <clears throat> that did erupt into Lake Idaho. So the, the western part of the Snake River Plain was uh, under a lake between 10 to 3 million years ago intermittently. There was two phases of it. Um, <clears throat> there is some evidence that some of those rhyolitic lava flows went into that lake body, that body of water over there. But those were not when the area was over the hotspot. Those were much later. Those were like residual rhyolitic magmatism, just like we have with like the, the big buttes around Idaho Falls, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> do you find evidence of basalt dams on the Snake River closer to Jackson, maybe in Swan Valley? Yeah, there's a couple in Swan Valley, um, Dan Moore at BYU-Idaho and Tiffany Rivera at Westminster are, are two of the people that came to mind that are working on those. When you drive Highway 26, um, just west of, well, a few miles west of the town of Swan Valley, you go through a big reddish road cut there, um, and that's part of a lava dam. And they're trying to work out the story of like, okay, how how expansive was this lava dam? How long lived was it? <clears throat> that sort of thing. But there's some pillow lavas and some of those road cuts there around Swan Valley. Um, and there's also this hyaloclastite, this uh, breccia, this uh, fragmented tufts that are clear evidence of hydrovolcanism. So definitely over in Eastern Idaho, along the South Fork of the Snake River, there was uh, lava dams and some uh, hydrovolcanism. We're just not sure of the timing and the extent and how long it, it lasted. Right. Well, we're going to have to get Tiffany back here to, to talk about that. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so uh, have the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Twin Falls expressed any concern about <laughs> the uh, cover of your book and the lava pouring over the bridge abutments? 
it, it hasn't hurt real estate, that's for sure. So um, I don't think, I think things are so good here economically that that's probably the least of their worries. So um, yeah, they just, the publisher just wanted something, either a past or a future <clears throat> geologic event. And they wanted it to be in kind of an iconic landscape. And my first thought was to be, was to have the Bonneville flood. Like that would be, you know, the premier event. But I'm like, well, what does that look like graphically? It's just a bunch of raging water on the cover of a book and there's no landmarks or anything. And so, um, so we came, came up with this design and, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, uh, it's not affecting business too much around here. Okay. So real estate prices aren't going down. At the no, moment. they're, they're, they're as insane here as they are everywhere. Right. So, well, yeah. yes. So talk, can you tell us about when pillow lavas form, uh, can they form right up to the, the surface of the water or do they need actual depth of water to form in? Yeah, that's a really good question because sometimes we see pillow lavas forming at fairly shallow levels. Um, and so some of it depends on how degassed the, the lava is. If the, if the magma has just erupted, if the lava has just erupted uh, and contains a lot of the dissolved gas in it, um, as that gets closer to the surface, you've got that internal gas pressure in the lava that might fragment it and make it a little bit more explosive uh, than it would be otherwise. But if that lava's traveled a, a quite a distance, and this is what we typically see in, in the Snake River Plain, if that lava's traveled five, 10 miles from its volcanic vent, a lot of the dissolved gases have escaped. Uh, and so as a consequence, you can get those, those pillow basalts built up pretty close to the, the water surface there or to the top. And in places I see such planar um, <clears throat> tops to those pillow lavas that it leads me to believe that they, as long as they're at the water surface, they're, prop, they're forming pillows. Um, but once they build up above that, then you get sort of the typical subaerial basalts above that point. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> one of our members, uh, Cynthia's husband actually studied in, in the Manan Buttes. And so his question, there's an older butte between North and South Butte. Right. And it was partially buried by the later eruptions. There was quite a bit of water. So the older buttes, uh, they, they don't have, they don't have any solid lava rock, all the ejectus, pumice and tuff. Right. Uh, so the whole, the Snake, Snake River and its associated aquifer were able to affect this whole eruption. Do you find other landforms similar to the Manan Buttes, other places on the Snake River Plain? I hope that's a clear question. Yeah, so he's absolutely correct. Uh, I focused on North and South because those are the big ones, but there is a little one in between that's poorly exposed. There's actually a couple more. I think there's six or seven total that line up along a North Northwest <laughs> trending line. And so Manan Buttes pop, uh, proper to, geologically is actually six or seven of them. Um, to my knowledge, there's not, I gotta think about this. So are there, well, Manan Buttes are, um, are uh, tough cones. Are there other tough cones in the Snake River Plain? There probably is, I just can't think of one off the top of my head. There's Sand Butte and Split Butte. I think those are both tough rings though. Um, so the, I think the Manan Buttes are, I'm pretty confident in saying that they're pretty unique um, in the Snake River Plain. I don't, I can't think of off the top of my head another example just like that. And certainly not one right next to the Snake River where uh, you know you, you built up that volcanic edifice in the gravels of the Snake River. That's pretty that's a pretty cool setting for that to have taken place there. Yeah. No, uh, the the last question is uh, when are we going to go on a field trip with you to <laughs> to look at some of these sites and can you bring enough copies of your roadside geology book so we can all buy one? Yeah, that's that. I would love to do a field trip. Uh, just say when, and we'll put it together. Um, the books you can get, <coughs> excuse me, um, you can get. They're on Amazon. Uh, they're at uh, a lot of like the visitor centers at Craters the Moon and City of Rocks and some of those places. Um, you can also, if you Google my name um, uh, or on my Facebook page, there's ways you can buy them directly for me if you want like a signed copy or something like that. Um, okay. 
yeah. that's what we want, of course. Yeah, sure. So I'd be happy to, to send those to people if that's what they'd like. They can just get a hold of me. I'm pretty easy to find. I'm the only geologist here at CSI, so <laughs> yeah, the lone wolf. So yeah, but that'd be great. I would love to do a field trip um, with your group. Um, seems like a really good audience. And these are just really exceptional sites. And I, I need to learn more about them too. I think I'm just sort of scratching the surface on some of them. So I'd love to get people out there and see what they think. Well, good. Well, Sean, thank you very much. This is an excellent talk. Uh, it's, it's in the neighborhood and we're going to take you up on your offer. Uh, it won't be in July or August, I promise. Uh, right. Let's do something in the spring or fall. <laughs> ex exactly. Right. Uh, but we, we absolutely will. And uh, again, I want to, I want to thank you for excellent photographs, clear and lucid explanations as well. Uh, yeah. And I want to remind everyone in two weeks, June 15th, uh, University of Wyoming, Andy Parsican is going to talk about how the changing climate is affecting permafrost in the Arctic, uh, which is, is a very big deal up there. So again, thank you very much, Sean, and uh, we'll, we'll see you in eastern Idaho. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate the time and everyone paying attention. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the chance to share with everyone. So thank you so much. Yeah. And I think we'll put in a bulk order for the books. There you go. That'll <laughs> work. I tried to get them in the, one of the bookstores in Jackson Hole, but uh, I don't think they bid on it. So just ask your bookstore to get them and they can get them if they want either way. Well, and I will insist that our library have at least a, one or two copies. So. Yeah. It's a nice little book. It, you know, there's 23 different sites that it just kind of, it, it talks you through the geologic story. So it's meant to be either used while you're sitting in your armchair or you're actually out at the site. It tells you specifically where to go, what to look for, asking questions. Uh, and there's sites that you know, but there's also a few places in there that are, I bet will surprise you. So if you're looking for a place to get out, it's, it's a fun little adventure guide, if nothing else. Right. Well, every time I drive over Pine Creek Pass, I'm trying to figure out the geology there. So this will definitely help. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you and good night, everyone.